Let's talk about the pathophysiology and diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy. So cardiomyopathy, if you break down the word cardiomyopathy, you can remember that it's a disease of the heart muscle because cardio stands for heart, myo, muscle, and pathy disease. So a disease of the heart muscle. And dilated cardiomyopathy is a specific type of cardiomyopathy. Now before we get into what causes dilated cardiomyopathy, let's first just briefly review some of the normal um, cardiac or heart physiology. All right, so when the heart normally beats, the, ventri the muscles of the ventricles, the bottom part of the heart, actually ex they re those muscles relax, causing the ventricles to expand. And this draws blood in from the atria. And then those muscles contract, and in that contraction of the muscles kind of ejects, ejects the blood out of the aorta and the pulmonary artery to send the blood either to the body or to the lungs where it gets oxygenated. So uh, a couple terms I want to just describe here real quick, and the first one is systole. And what systole is, is it's the period of time in which the heart muscle is contracting. And so during systole, blood is being ejected out of the ventricles to either the body or the lungs. But then the other period of time in the cardiac cycle is known as diastole. And so during diastole, the muscles of the heart are relaxing, and so the chamber, the ventricle size, is getting bigger, and this is what's drawing blood into the ventricles, so the ventricles are filling. So just a recap of that, during systole, the ventricles are contracting and ejecting blood out of the heart and also during that time that means the atria are filling and then during diastole the atria are emptying the blood into a relaxed ventricle. Alright so now that we've reviewed the normal cardiac cycle let's get into the pathogenesis of, cardio of dilated cardiomyopathy and what I mean by that is how this disease develops. Basically, dilated cardiomyopathy is caused by a dysfunction in the heart muscle's ability to contract. And since this is when the heart is contracting, which we talked about earlier is called syst systole, this is known as a systolic failure. So let's kind of see what this looks like. All right, now I'm going to just adjust the drawing of the heart, the heart here, and, as, and now you can see the, the heart muscle is kind of thin. The, the, the walls of the ventricle have got, ventricles have gotten a little bit thinner, especially down here at the bottom, it's a little bit thinner. And this is just drawn in here to demonstrate that the muscle isn't able to contract as well. So let's see what this looks like during, uh, during the cardiac cycle. Well, so now the heart is contracting, but it's not able to eject all of the blood out of the ventricle, because normally the, the ventricles eject somewhere between 50 and 75 percent of the blood out every time they contract. But now this decreased ability of the ventricles to contract, this systolic failure, is causing more blood to remain in the ventricle. And if more blood's remaining in the ventricle, less blood has left the ventricle. And so there's a decreased flow to the rest of the body. And this is known as a decreased ejection fraction. And so what happens to compensate for this ejection fraction, fraction is that the chambers dilate. And this is why it's known as dilated cardiomyopathy. So how does this compensate for the decreased ejection fraction? Well, it would make sense that the body needs a certain volume of blood with every contraction of the heart. And with a decreased ejection fraction, it's getting a lower volume. But if the chambers dilate, the total volume of the chambers, of the ventricles, increases so even if you have a decreased percentage of this increased volume you have an adequate volume of blood that's actually ejected ejected from the ventricles each heartbeat and this dilation gets progressively worse and worse and eventually it actually and not only the are the ventricles just dilated but then the atria become dilated too as well because the backup of blood and this gets to a point where the chambers can't dilate enough. They just become as dilated as they can get. And this is when you, when someone with dilated cardiomyopathy starts to develop the signs and symptoms of heart failure. And these signs and symptoms of heart failure are due to two processes. They're either due to a decreased ability to pump the flow forwards, which will cause things like chest pain and because you're not getting enough blood to the heart, or it may cause someone to uh, 
faint and pass out because they're not getting enough blood to the brain, or you can also have signs and symptoms due to the blood backing up and kind of backing up behind the heart, and you get things like uh, swelling or edema of the legs and abdomen, which is known as ascites. So what actually are the causes of dilated my cardiomyopathy? Well, it can be genetic, and these genetic causes are due to problems with some of the proteins in the muscle cells themselves that don't allow them to contract quite as well. Um, but it can also be due to inflammation of the heart from something like a viral infection. This is known as myocarditis. Or it can be due to toxins that affect the heart. The most common of these is alcohol. Or another unfortunate cause of this is actually pregnancy. And we're not exactly sure what about pregnancy causes dilated cardiomyopathy, but there's definitely an increased risk of developing cardiomyopathy due, during pregnancy. And then the last one I want to mention here is idiopathic, meaning we don't know what causes it. But it's also important to note what are not the causes of dilated cardiomyopathy. So this is, and specifically, um, dilated cardiomyopathy is not caused by ischemic heart disease, valvular heart disease, so diseases of the valves of the heart, or hypertension. And it's important to note this because these diseases can cause heart failure and it has a simu similar presentation to dilated cardiomyopathy and, and that the heart dilates and results in a systolic failure. But the difference is in those conditions, the heart failure is secondary to the other condition, whereas in dilated cardiomyopathy, it's a primary disease of the heart muscle itself. So dilated cardiomyopathy is not caused by ischemia, valvular heart disease, or hypertension. So now that we've gone over the cause of dilated cardiomyopathy, how do we diagnose dilated cardiomyopathy? The first step is going over the patient's history and physical. I'm going to just abbreviate that H and P. And the signs and symptoms that are the history and physical are really just going to be consi consistent with with heart failure, but there's not many that are very specific to dilated cardiomyopathy. So the next thing is labs. And one of the most important labs in any cause of heart failure is something that's known as the brain natriuretic peptide, or the BNP. And BNP is elevated in conditions that cause stretching of the heart, such as dilated cardiomyopathy. So it's elevated in dilated cardiomyopathy. But that's not, ex that's not very specific, as it's also elevated in lots of other causes of uh, heart failure. So next we're going to go to some special tests. And the first one I want to mention is an EKG. In the EKG of dilated cardiomyopathy, it's almost always abnormal, but the findings are nonspecific. So it doesn't really, an abnormal EKG doesn't necessarily say you have di someone has dilated cardiomyopathy, but a normal EKG is will almost rule out the disease. So almost everyone with dilated cardiomyopathy will have an abnormal, but it's going to be nonspecific. And then the next one is a chest x-ray, which I'll just abbreviate CXR. And this is going to show something called cardiomegaly. And this just means an enlarged heart. So it makes sense that if in a dilated cardiomyopathy, the heart gets enlarged, then on the chest x-ray, you'll see a big heart. And then the next test and the best test for dilated cardiomyopathy is an echocardiogram. And an echocardiogram is an ultrasound of the heart. In an echocardiogram, you can see the, the dilation of the chambers, as well as the decreased ejection fraction. There's two other tests I want to mention, but they're not routinely used in the diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy. And the first one is an angiogram, and this is a study that looks at the blood vessels of the heart. And since I said dilated cardiomyopathy is not caused by ischemia, an angiogram is not going to show any signs of ischemia. And the last thing I want to mention is a biopsy of the heart muscle itself. And in a lot of types of cardiomyopathy, biopsies of the heart muscle are very important and they give you an idea of what the cause of um, the cardiomyopathy is. And kind of like the EKG, the biopsy is usually going to be abnormal, but it's not very specific. So if a provider thinks a patient has dilated cardiomyopathy, these are the three major tests to diagnose it. Um, these tests may be helpful, but are only really used if the provider is trying to work up uh, the patient for another conditions, and then they end up realizing that the patient has dilated cardiomyopathy. So just remember that dilated cardiomyopathy is a dysfunction in the heart's ability to contract, which means it is a systolic heart failure um, that manifests as a decreased ejection fraction, and so the body, the heart will compensate by dilating its chambers, and that 
is why it's called dilated cardiomyopathy and that it's diagnosed primarily with an EKG, a chest x-ray, and the best test for it is an echocardiogram.